In this module, we will begin what we call time response analysis. In particular, we will examine the behavior of first order systems. So what we will begin in this module is what we call time response analysis. This is actually a continuation of what we've been doing throughout the semester, where we've been trying to determine the response of physical systems. In this module, we will begin to look at a few standard systems, in particular first order systems. In subsequent modules, we will look at slightly more complicated systems called second order systems, and then we will address systems that don't fit either of these two standard forms. So, so far in this semester, we've been attempting to find the time response, in other words, the output as a function of time for different dynamic systems for a given set of initial conditions and inputs. We've done this for mechanical systems, electrical systems, electromechanical systems, but it basically encompasses solving a differential equation or transfer function model. There is also benefit to classifying or sort of memorizing the response of some standard systems to standard inputs. In particular, we will look at what we call first-order systems and second-order systems. These are basically the two simplest uh, forms of systems you can have. By understanding these two simple types of systems very well, it can provide insight into more complicated systems. We will also look at the response of these standard systems to a few standard inputs. For example, impulse, step, ramp, and sinusoidal inputs. These inputs are of particular importance because they correspond to things that happen in the real world, the physical world, but also because understanding how a system responds to these standard inputs can give us understanding of how the system responds to more general inputs. This figure here basically illustrates what we mean by time response. And so here we have some system. Uh, we will look at standard systems, i.e. a first order system or a second order system, and then we will look at how it responds to standard inputs, which in this case is a step input. Here then is the output response. The characteristics of this output, if we can understand it very well, can be used as specifications for our engineering design. For example, the characteristics of this this response, if it has a standard form, can be used to specify how fast our system is, how oscillatory our system is, how quickly the oscillation dies out, and even what the steady state behavior of the system is. And by using these characteristics as specifications, it gives us a quantifiable measure to design to. If I'm designing a control system for a motor, or I'm designing a cruise control, how do I know if I've done a good enough job? Or what's a measure of, of sort of the performance of the system? Well, the characteristics of this sort of standard response is one basis for these requirements. Understanding these standard sort of responses can also be used for black box modeling. If you look at this and you recognize it as a first order step response or a second order step response, the character or the properties of the response can be used to estimate parameters of the model, in particular to fit a standard model, a first order model or a second order model to the system. And so these motivating reasons for why we want to understand or classify these standard responses may not be absolutely clear at this point, but I think they will, you will understand as we go along um, better why, why it's important to, to, to learn these. So the first type of system we're going to look at is called a first order system. When described by a differential equation, the model has this form. In other words, uh, it's an equation that's a function of a variable and the first derivative of that variable, in this case y, and we have a forcing function u. And since the highest order derivative is a first order derivative, that's why we call it a first order system. We can also represent such systems as transfer functions. 
the way that we arrive at a transfer function model is to take the Laplace transform of the differential equation assuming zero initial conditions and then we rearrange it into the form output over input. In this case, presuming that u is the input and y is the output, we get a transfer function of this form. Looking at this, we can recognize this transfer function is representing a first order system because it has a single pole. There's one value of s for which the denominator is equal to zero. Further looking at this transfer function, in order to say that it has the, the standard canonical form, we need the denominator to have this form where it's a constant times s plus one. If this is not a one, then it's not in the, in the standard form, and we need to rearrange it into that form. The key parameters of this system are what we call the time constant tau and the DC gain K. And these two parameters completely determine the behavior of a first order system and can be used, for example, as requirements for a system. In particular, what these parameters mean or indicate about a system and where their names come from will be more clear uh, in, a, in a couple slides. Even though this first order model is very simple, it's the simplest type of model you can have, it turns out that many real systems actually have this basic form. Or if they don't, uh, many real systems can be well approximated by a first order model. Perhaps the most well-known example of a first order system is an RC circuit like the one shown here. So the differential equation modeling this system can be arrived at using first principles like Kirchhoff's laws as we've learned previously. If we go through that procedure, we will arrive at a first order differential equation shown here where the system is modeled by an equation in terms of of a function, the output voltage E sub O and its first derivative and the forcing function, which is the input voltage E sub I. In this case, you may recall or recognize that the time constant of this system is equal to R times C. Another example, which is analogous to the circuit, which is modeled, which can also be modeled by a first order differential equation is, is this cooling example. So for example, you can say that we have a cup of hot water at temperature T and it's losing heat to the to the environment which is at a temperature T sub A for ambient temperature. The manner in which the temperature of the water changes is well described by this first order differential equation. This has a similar form to the circuit because this thermal system can also be thought of as having some capacitance and some resistance. For example, you can imagine that the water itself has some thermal capacity. The water is able to hold some amount of heat energy. Furthermore, the loss of heat from the water to the environment uh, can be described by some resistance. You know, basically, the, the interface between the water and the environment determines how easily heat is lost. For example, if this cup is well insulated, there would be a high thermal resistance impeding the loss of heat. However, if the, if the cup was made out of a conductor with, with good thermal conductivity, then the resistance would be small. Because of this fact, because of these resistive and capacitive properties of the system, the differential equation describing this system is very similar to the RC circuit. Another analogous system for fluid flow is something like this, where we have some fluid flowing into the system. We have some reservoir, again, with some capacity representing how much fluid it can hold, and some fluid flowing out of the reservoir, where the setting of this valve represents the amount of resistance to, to the fluid flowing out. And so again, the fact that this system has resistance and capacitance show that it's well described by a, an analogous first order differential equation. Going back to our mechanical systems, if we modeled a system consisting of a damper in series with a spring, it would be modeled by a first order differential equation like the one shown here. Similarly, if we had a mass with a single damper and no spring, 
it would also be modeled by a first order differential equation. So this is just a few examples of the many of systems, of real physical systems, that are well modeled by, as first order systems. Even more complicated higher order systems, for example a DC motor, can be well approximated by first order models. At this point, we're now going to solve for the step response of a first order system. And the way that we're going to do this is the same way that we've done previously in the course, where we'll sort of do all of the calculations by hand, uh, longhand. But once we've done this once, we won't do it again. You know, this type of system and this type of input are so common that we're in essence just going to memorize the result. Recalling the form of a first order transfer function, where we'll assume that our output is y and our input is u, it's described by the standard form k, which is our dc gain, over tau, which is our time constant times s plus 1. And ultimately, what we're trying to find is y of t. And the way that we will find y of t is from y of s. So looking at this, if this transfer function we call g of s, y of s is simply equal to g of s, and we multiply the input u of s to the other side. So y of s is equal to g of s times u of s, where the transfer function g of s has the form k over tau s plus 1. And we multiply that by u of s, since u of t is the unit step, recall what the Laplace transform of the unit step is. It's equal to 1 over s. In order to find y of t, we in essence need to take the inverse Laplace transform of this expression for y of s. If we have a fairly expansive Laplace transform table, this may be found in the Laplace transform pairs table. If we don't, however, we may need to rearrange this into a simpler form. And the way that we do that is with the partial fraction expansion. So we'll go ahead and do that again as a refresher. Uh, we have two poles that are distinct and real. And so we can split this up into two terms, one with the denominator of s and one with the denominator of tau s plus 1. Since the poles are distinct and real, we have what we call case 1 and the numerators or the residues are simply constants a and b. And what we want to do is we want to solve for a and b. And the way that we do that is once we split it, we basically do the opposite and put it back together by getting a common denominator. So in order to get a common denominator of s times the quantity tau s plus 1, we need to take this term and we need to multiply the top and the bottom by tau s plus 1. And we need to take this term and we need to multiply the top and the bottom by s. Once we do that, we can combine them. And our new numerator is a times the quantity tau s plus 1 plus b times s. We can then solve for a and b by recognizing that the right-hand side of this expression is exactly equal to the left-hand side of this expression. They have the same denominator, so they must have the same numerator. This numerator must equal this numerator. So we match the numerators. Looking at this, uh, it appears that we have one equation with two unknowns, or two unknowns are a and b, but in reality it's as if we have two equations because every power of s must match. So all of the constant terms on the right hand side must equal the constant terms on the left. All of the s terms on the right must equal the s terms on the left, and if we had higher powers then they must match, match as well. So the s terms call, it's like s to the first power. On the left, we have no s terms, so that's equal to zero. 
on the right, if we distribute that A, we have A tau S, and then we also have BS. So 0 is equal to A tau plus B. Then we also do the constant terms. So on the left, the only constant term we have is K. On the right, if I distribute the A, I'll get A times 1. That's our only constant term on the right-hand side. So immediately, we have that A is equal to K. Then we can solve for B. Subtracting A tau to the other side, we get that B is equal to negative A tau, where A is equal to K. So B is equal to negative K tau. Once we have that, then we can go ahead and do the inverse Laplace transform. We find y of t is the inverse Laplace transform of y of s, where y of s is equal to this, where we found that a is k and b is negative k tau. Looking at this, the first term has the form of a unit step with a constant k multiplying it. So we can think of this as k times a unit step, or we can just think of it as a constant k starting at t equals 0. This term looks similar to something that we would find in the Laplace transform table, uh, the entry 1 over s plus a, except this tau here doesn't quite match. So what we can do is we can divide through by tau in the numerator and the denominator, and we get, if we divide through by tau in the numerator, it'll cancel that tau. If we divide through by tau in the denominator, it'll cancel that tau. And then this will become 1 divided by tau. This has the same form as 1 over s plus a, where we've got a constant negative k out front, which we can pull out front. And then if we look at the Laplace transform table, 1 over s plus a has the inverse Laplace transform of e to the minus at, where in this case a is equal to 1 over tau. So e to the minus at, where a is 1 over tau. And we presume that it doesn't begin until t equals 0. So this equation represents the, the time response of a standard first order system to a standard step input. Thinking back, this is the sort of response that we would expect. So our forcing function is a constant, in essence a 1. So we would expect that we would have a particular solution that is also a constant the homogeneous solution representing the natural response is this, and it matches the form we would expect since we have a single pole that's completely real and has negative real part, we would expect it, the homogeneous solution to be exponential decay with no oscillation since there's no imaginary part. So, so this is exactly what we'd expect. Moving to the next slide, the form y of t, uh, if we factor out k, the constant k, has that form. Since we've solved for this once, we're now basically just going to memorize this response, and we're going to memorize sort of the shape of the graph of the output. Looking at this, when t is equal to 0, we'll have e to the 0, which is equal to 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. So at t equal to 0, we would expect y to also be equal to 0. So the response of our system will start at 0. As t gets large, this term will decay to 0 exponentially. And then as t reaches infinity or approaches infinity, we'll have this will approach 0 
and so y will approach k times 1, just k. Therefore, this blue line captures the response of the system. Looking at this, we can see that the sort of steady state value of the, of the response is k, our parameter k, which we call the DC gain. And the reason it gets that name is because DC represents direct current, like a, like a DC circuit, uh, where a DC circuit, the voltage is, is constant. And so if I apply a constant input, which we have in this case a step, in steady state, this is how much the output will be multiplied by or scaled by, by an amount K. That's the, the gain of the system when the system is in steady state in DC. In this case, it was a unit step input, so the output is just simply k. But if we had given the, imp the system an input of a, of a step of magnitude 2 or a step of magnitude 5, then the output wouldn't be k. So think about for a second what it would be equal to. If we gave this system an input step of magnitude 2, then the output would be 2 times k where again k is the scaling factor, k is the, is the multiplying factor. If we gave the system an input step of magnitude 5, then the output in steady state would be 5 times k. If we consider the value of the system when the time is equal to tau, we substitute that in here for t, then we'll have tau divided by tau, which is 1. e to the minus 1 is equal to 0 0.368. 1 minus that is equal to 0 0.632. So the value of our system at one time constant at t equal to tau means that the output will be 63% of the final value. So if we're looking at the total change in the output of the system, when we reach 63.2% of that change, we've reached one time constant. If we go even further and look at the system at subsequent values of time, multiples of tau, at 4 tau, if we substituted that in for t, we would have 4 tau divided by tau which is 4. e to the minus 4 is approximately 0 0.02. So when we've reached four time constants, when the time has reached four time constants, the output is 98% of the total change in output. And so a good rule of thumb is when the output is reached approximately 2% of its final, final value, we consider the system to have reached steady state. Since this response is exponential, it, it only approaches the final value as t approaches infinity. It never actually reaches it. So an approximation of us being close enough to the final value, to the steady state value, is to say we're within 2% of the final value. There are different definitions. Some people may use a 1% definition or a 5% definition, but the, the basic concept is the same. So looking at this system, we will basically memorize this shape. And just based on our understanding of these two parameters, k and tau, we can recreate this shape at any, at any time without going through this whole process of doing a partial fraction expansion, doing an inverse Laplace transform, etc. In particular, the, the parameter k, the DC gain, determines the steady state value of the system. And the time constant tau identifies the speed of response of the system. On the previous slide, we saw how the parameters k and tau characterize the response, the step response for first order system. This may give you some insight into how you might use those parameters as requirements or specifications for a system.
another application of knowing or memorizing the standard first order response is to, is to perform black box modeling. So let's say, for example, that we have some physical system. We've applied a unit step input and we've observed the following output shown in this graph. Just by a quick glance, we now recognize this as a first order step response. And so what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and match a model of the form k over tau s plus 1 based on this unit step response. So looking at this, the steady state value of this system is 2. And since the input is a unit step, the output has been scaled by a factor of 2 in DC. That means that we have a DC gain of 2. If we had given the system an input of magnitude 2, then the output wouldn't, would not be 2, it would be 4. But, but the scaling would be the same. The scaling between the input and the output is the DC gain, which in this case is 2. Furthermore, we can also attempt to identify the time constant. So one parameter defining the first order model is the DC gain, the other is the time constant, where the time constant is defined by the amount of time that it takes the system to reach 63.2% of its total change. And so looking at this situation, the output changes in amount 2 from 0 to 2. And so 63.2% of 2 is approximately 1.26. And so we look at our graph at approximately 1.26 and the system reaches that value at approximately one second. So by definition, this is the time constant of our system. Therefore, by inspection of the output response, we can see that k is approximately 2 and tau is approximately 1. Therefore, matching this first order model form our transfer function for an input of u and an output of y is k divided by tau s plus 1. Therefore, we found a model that fits the output response of this system for a given input. The challenge is we don't necessarily know physically what makes the DC gain be 2 what makes the time constant be 1 because we didn't derive this model from first principles. If this was an RC circuit, we would know that the time constant is based on R times C. But in this case, where we're treating the system as just a black box, we don't know what any of the parameters mean, so it makes it hard to design the system. But such a model could be good, good enough for predicting the behavior of the system. However, if we gave the system a, another input that, that wasn't a step, a sinusoid or a ramp or something, it may be the case that this model doesn't match very well. So black box models, if you recall, can match very well or can predict the response very well for the same conditions that the, the experiment was performed under, but it may not work very well under different conditions. If we had a situation where instead of being given the output response and trying to back out the model, instead we were given the model, we could also determine the output response or graph the output response, draw this graph without going through all the trouble of performing a partial fraction expansion and performing the inverse plus transform, etc. Looking at this, just to be careful, Another form of this transfer function, if we divided the numerator and the denominator by 2, would be 1 divided by the denominator 0 0.5 times s plus 0 0.5. These two transfer functions have the exact same form, but this transfer function does not have the canonical form. So sometimes the mistake is made where you'll get a transfer function that looks like this,
you'll recognize it to be first order because it has a single pole. But then you'll say that the DC gain is 1 and the time constant is 0.5 when that's not correct because the transfer function doesn't have the canonical form such as this where we want this value to be equal to 1. So that's just a little something to be careful of. This concludes module 10. So recall we introduced the notion of time response analysis where we tried to motivate why we might want to memorize or learn the response of certain standard systems to certain standard inputs. In this case, we looked at first order systems, i.e. systems that have a single pole. We learned how these first order systems are defined by the parameters of a time constant and a DC gain. And we also memorized the shape of a first order system step response.